pick up a Bible, we're just going to read the last plague together before I preach on this passage. I want us to see where Egypt is left in pitch black in the last of the plagues. So this is on page 67 of the Red Bibles, chapter 10 of Exodus and verse 21. Then the Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hands towards the sky so that darkness spreads over Egypt, darkness that can be felt. So Moses stretched out his hand towards the sky and total darkness covered all Egypt for three days. No one could see anyone else or move about for three days, yet all the Israelites had light in the places where they lived. Then Pharaoh summoned Moses and said, go worship the Lord. Even your women and children may go with you, only leave your flocks and herds behind. But Moses said, you must allow us to have sacrifices and burnt offerings to present to the Lord our God. Our livestock too must go with us, not a hoof is to be left behind. We have to use some of them in worshipping the Lord our God. And until we get there, we will not know what we are to use to worship the Lord. But the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart and he was not willing to let them go. Pharaoh said to Moses, get out of my sight. Make sure you do not appear before me again. The day you see my face, you will die. Just as you said, Moses replied, I will never appear before you again. Let's pray. Father, these are difficult verses to read as we see your hand of judgment fall upon the nation of Egypt and particularly upon Pharaoh. But please, our Father, would our hearts be nothing like his? Would they not be hard, but might they instead be supple and recipient to all that you have to say to us? Please teach us. For Jesus' sake we ask it. Amen. Well, we're back in Exodus, and we have arrived at the plagues. I don't know how many of you caught your interest last night that Tyson Fury, the man who was two years ago heavyweight world champion, was back in the boxing ring after a two-year break. It's been a turbulent two years, but he was back in the ring fighting an Albanian man called Sefer Safiri. Um, It was expected that he would win. The, The pundits that I listened to yesterday said he'll win in the fourth round. So he won between the fourth and the fifth round. It was all pretty predictable because Tyson Fury was known to be so much a better boxer. It was a boxing bout with the table seemingly tilted in an obvious direction. And yet whenever you watch sporting fixtures of any kind, you know that even when it's a million to one, there's always that little chance, isn't there? That little chance that the underdog might win. Sefer Safiri, maybe he'll land something on Tyson Fury, maybe he will turn the table. So it didn't happen last night. And as we come to the plagues, there is, there's a little bit of an echo of a boxing bout going on here. A little bit of an echo. Because we find ourselves in the midst of ten rounds with the lords contending with Pharaoh. But while there may be ten rounds, while there might be a contest going on, really the lines of comparison between a boxing match and the plagues here all cease. Because really... There is no chance, Pharaoh has no chance here in contending with the God of heaven. This is totally one-sided. Victory is certain for the Lord. And as we approach our passage today, we're going to be looking specifically at the first nine plagues. And we're going to look at them under the simple heading, nine plagues and one king. Nine plagues, one king. And what is abundantly plain in our passage is that the God of heaven the God of Israel, the God of our Lord Jesus Christ is the only king of all. He's the only creator and he is the most mighty and powerful king that there is going. Our passage is not to give us a a sense of self-importance as we come to it today. Instead, it is to cause us awe and wonder and worship as we see God in his greatness working for the rescue of his enslaved people. It's a bit like if you've ever been to the Alps, You don't ever go and stand before an enormous mountain in order to gain a sense of self-importance, do you? You you Instead, you just go, oh my goodness, this is just, I'm so small, this is just so huge, and and your 
you're gobsmacked. Well, God is made. You're gobsmacked at the greatness of our worlds. And as we come to our passage, I, there, there is a desire within me that each of us would be, would be amazed that there would be a sense of awe and worship and wonder as we see God revealed as the great and mighty God working to rescue his people out of slavery. Now, so far in the book of Exodus, we've found God's people slaved, killed, and under the brutal regime of Pharaoh. Moses has been provided by God to be the saviour of his people, but it's not until the age of 80 that Moses is in Pharaoh's court for the showdown. Seems that we've had a long lead in. But as we saw last week, as we looked at chapter 6 and verse 1, there's a new word uttered from the lips of God. He says, now, now rescue is coming. Now rescue is coming. Now everything is changed. And we find as Moses go, and Aaron go back to Pharaoh time and time again, that there is a command issued, let God's people go. Should Pharaoh comply, he'll lose his million strong slave force that are working hard for him. But as we will see, should he not comply with the command that God gives him, he will see his slaves go across the horizon. He will see his nation, Egypt, ravaged and broken into pieces. He will see the Israelites made wealthy as the Egyptians just throw money at them. He'll see his nation broken and bankrupt and he will see himself dead in the bottom of the Red Sea, should he not comply. Because he is standing against someone he cannot contend with. He is standing against the God of heaven. This morning we're going to deal with the first nine of the plagues. My intent is to move quickly. And then next week, as we have our all-age family service, we're going to see what happened on that last plague, the plague of the firstborn, where the Passover lamb was provided. But we're going to see first, as we work our way through these nine plagues, what's going on. And my hope is that we get a sense of wonder at God's greatness and power. We would be awestruck at who he is. Now, if I was to sum up, what's, what's the big point of this passage in a sentence? I think it would be this. It would be to say, the Lord's confrontation with Pharaoh reveals that the Lord is the only God and King. The Lord's confrontation with Pharaoh reveals that the Lord is the only God and King. And I think that is made most plain in these two verses in chapter 9, verse 15. Why, why so many plagues? Why not just wipe Egypt off the face of the planet and set your people free? Because God wants people to know that he is the only God. The Lord wants the world to know that he is the only creator and king. For by now I could have stretched out my hand and struck you, Pharaoh, and your people with a plague that would have wiped you off the earth. But I have raised you up for this very purpose, that I might show you my power and that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. That God is trying to show himself as the great God so that people might recognize that opposition to him is foolish, futile and deadly. And his people would realize that this God is the God to trust. Well, let's walk through the plagues, shall we? And we're going to try and do, I'm going to try and do this quickly. I mean, if this is a nine-point sermon, we're looking at kind of at least an hour and a half here, aren't we? And the problem is there are two more points after the plagues are done. What's that? Long. We're going to try and move quickly. Have nimble fingers. Please pay attention. Please stay with me. I will do our best. But before we get to the nine plagues, we need to recognize that there's a there's a prototype plague that turns up. Because as chapter 7, that first bit that Esther read to us, shows that Moses and Aaron are sent into Pharaoh's court as a showdown and a throwdown. Aaron throws his staff upon the floor, and the staff becomes a snake. But then Pharaoh obviously isn't very impressed, and he wheels in his own magicians, who we would say have some game because they throw their own staffs upon the floor and they become snakes too. Pharaoh goes, I'm not impressed. Now, now, pause just for a second. Note that the mention of magicians, staffs becoming snakes, what we have here, I think, is a highlight of the spiritual, even the demonic opposition, satanic opposition that Egypt is towards God's people, represented in the magic that is going on. There's a spiritual dimension to this opposition. Press play. What happens with the snakes? Well, no further instruction is needed to Aaron's star snake. It knows what to do. It eats the other snakes. Now, this simple first prototype 
plague really is a proclamation to Pharaoh, and it should be enough. Remember, Pharaoh is pictured himself as a cobra-type god king. The snakes are eaten. Pharaoh, your snakes have been eaten. You will be devoured if you try to come toe-to-toe with the God of heaven. Back down. But what we see is Pharaoh does not back down at all. And in this proclamation, we see both a proclamation that God is going to win and Pharaoh is going to harden his heart. Now, in order that you get a bit of a measure of where we're going with these plagues, you should have a little sheet of paper tucked in your notice sheet, which just gives a... How can we structure nine plagues so that we get a bit of a hold on them? Well, I think that Moses has written this part of Exodus in intention in three blocks. So you'll see there down on the left-hand side of that table, one, two, three, and each one is made up of three plagues. Note that the full, under the full warning, each of those three cycles begins with a warning coming to Pharaoh in the morning. And then another warning, and then the third plague, there's no warning. And that cycle is repeated, as are those other cycles there. The intent is to show that there are three blocks here, and we're going to try and deal with these plagues in three blocks, making observations at the end of each one. And it's worth noting that there is an increasing intensity as we head down the table. An increasing intensity as we head down the table. The first plague to fall upon the land of Egypt is that of the plague of blood. You cannot overstate the importance of the river Nile in the land of Egypt. It is like the beating heart of their nation. It is the place where drinking water is found, where food is provided through the fish. It is the place that irrigates their land so that their land is fertile and produces food. It is a source of trade. And yet when Pharaoh refuses to comply with the instruction, let God's people go, God stops Egypt's beating heart and fills it with blood. And what is the result? Well, we find that the fish die. It stinks. You smell it. Smell of rotting blood throughout the land. Everywhere that there is water, there is blood. Again, we're amazed, aren't we, that in the telling of this plague coming, that the magicians, Pharaoh's magicians, seem able to repeat what Moses and Aaron have just done. They also are able to make blood from water. How does Pharaoh respond? We're simply told that his heart is hard. He just doesn't, I don't want to notice, move on. Seven days pass until the blood starts to go. They dig a new trench along the river in order to find clean water. Horrendous blight upon their country. Their heart is stopped for a week. Then, plague number two, frogs. There were pictures of frogs that I think made you sick that I could have put up here. I'm just going to give you two. And I don't even know if they're real or not. There we go. The second plague turns up seven days later, and it would have been stomach-churning, spine-tingling, revolting because now the land is overrun with frogs. Again, in response to Pharaoh, refusing to let God's people go, the Nile is again the source of fear and judgment upon the nation of Egypt. Everywhere you put your foot, it lands on a frog. Every time you boil your kettle, you kill another frog that's managed to get in the kettle. Every time you go to pick up your phone, you pick up a frog and put it to your ear. Frog, 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 frog. 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 I mean, it would made I spy dead easy, wouldn't it? <laughs> I spy something beginning with F. OK, OK. You'll go. I sp- enough. Now, at first, this might appear amusing, mightn't it? But note that there is a sinister edge to what is going on here. This land is being ruined. This land is falling under the judgment of God. Again, note that the magicians, they've got some gain. You do frogs, we do frogs. But note that the magicians are just like little children because they know how to make a mess, they don't know how to clean it up. And so when the frogs just become far too much, who does Pharaoh call in to help him? He calls in Moses and Aaron because he knows his magicians can make a mess but they can't clear it up. And Pharaoh pleads, take the frogs away. But note his stubbornness here. Because Moses says, sure thing, you give me the time. If I was Pharaoh, I hope I'd have gone, do it right now and do it quick. But Pharaoh doesn't. In verse 10 we are told 
the Pharaoh basically says, we'll have the frogs for another day, and then you can take them away. He says, take them away tomorrow. What is, he, what is going on in this man's brain? What is going on in his heart? He is refusing to acknowledge that God is striking him. Enough of the frogs. Now we find the land is filled with gnats. Note here, there's no forewarning that comes when the gnats appear, just the dust is struck. Never been to Egypt. I'm pretty sure Egypt has a lot of dust. They would have had more than a lot of gnats. You wouldn't have been able to walk down the road without breathing in umpteen gnats. It wouldn't have just been on a bike that you'd have kept your mouth shut. You'd have surely worn a bandana across your mouth and your little glasses and hats and everywhere. Gnats were just everywhere. This time, the magician's power has run out because they can't do what Moses and Aaron have just done. And they even recognise what's happening here and they tell Pharaoh, verse 19 of chapter 7, no, sorry, verse 19 of chapter 8, this is the finger of God. But how does Pharaoh respond to their announcement that this is, this is beyond us, Pharaoh, you've got to watch out, you can't go toe-to-toe with the Lord here. What is Pharaoh hardened his heart and would not listen. What does this first round of plagues teach us? It teaches us this big point, doesn't it? Again, the Lord's confrontation with Pharaoh reveals that the Lord is the only God and King. There's no con- Pharaoh can't stand up to him. It just everything, The plagues just come upon him like a wave that he cannot stand against. And that is what God is at pains to point out. You see in chapter 7, verse 17, this is what the Lord says, by this you will know that I am the Lord. Chapter 8, verse 10, it will be as you say, so that you may know that there is no one like the Lord our God, he says, as the, he promises that frogs will go. And how does God show that he is the only God and king? Well, he does it by showing that he is the creator. But instead of making creation here, he is unravelling creation. The language actually throughout all of the plagues, but it's here especially in these first three plagues, is an utter inversion of the language we find in Genesis 1 and 2, where God makes everything. So before in Genesis chapter 1, we find that the water of the seas and the rivers teem with life. They produce fish of every kind. Here, the blood comes in the river and it kills fish of every kind. In Genesis, we see that the water teems with abundant different life, but here it just teems with frogs that aren't good for food and just good for burning, so it would seem. And then in this plague of gnats, did you note what was struck to make gnats? Dust. From where did Adam come? From the dust he was made. Whereas now the dust assaults him. A clear indication that death is coming and creation is being unravelled. I can, I can knit, did you know that? I, I can't knit, I can de-knit. If you give me a piece of knitting, I can undo it fast as anyone. That is what God is doing here. It's sobering, isn't it? He's pulling the thread. But he, I can't do that with creation, neither can you. But he is proving, I am the creator, I'm the only God here. Pharaoh, you must humble yourself. And we see echoes here of the Lord Jesus, although the Lord Jesus comes. He doesn't come to decreate, does he? He instead comes to give us a foretaste of the new creation. You see, in his miracles, he shows that he is the only God, because as he turns water into wine, he shows the party that's coming in heaven for all who will trust him. As he heals the sick, as he raises the dead, he says there's a new creation coming. I'm the creator, I'm the only creator. You must bow the knee to me. We should be awestruck at God's power here in Exodus and also in his Son. Round one, done. Round two. Three more plagues tied together. And we see that the land, as Pharaoh says, you ain't going anywhere, guys, is blighted with flies. Now, I grew up on a farm um, with livestock. We had pigs, we had poultry. um, And I I know what it's like to have a kitchen in which there are more than a few flies. We had a masterful technique with dealing with flies. It happened at least once a day during the summer. You'd close every door and every window and you'd fill the room with fly spray. And the flies got it. 30 minutes later, you return with a broom and you sweep them up. 
If you and I were in Egypt when this plague falls upon the land, we would need 10 times the amount of fly spray, and we would not need a broom, we'd need a shovel and a wheelbarrow to clear the kitchen. Imagine that shoveling out the flies. Again, everywhere you put your hand, you squish flies. Every time you go to brush your teeth, the flies on your toothbrush. Everywhere. Horrendous. And what is the result here? Well, the result is in chapter 8, verse 24, the land was ruined by the flies. We're starting to see that Egypt as a nation is being broken in God's hands. And Pharaoh appears, just in an instant, to have a change of heart, suggesting that Israel can go and make their sacrifices, but once the plague is lifted, once Moses and God has been merciful upon him, Pharaoh changes his mind and hardens his heart. The fifth plague would have brought upon Egypt economic ruin and famine too, because back in those days you didn't keep money, you showed how much money you had by how many cattle or sheep you owned. This was your banking system back in the day. But here, should you refuse, Pharaoh, to let my people go, we will kill your livestock. He refuses. And can you see the scene? There's the farmer, rushing, the Egyptian farmer, rushing round his field, nursing one cattle, trying to bring it back to health and to life, only to see it die. And he runs to the next cattle over here, and he nurses that one, only to see it to die. And then he's over here, and, and all the way around the country, cattle are just dying. Farmers are, farmers, cattle farmers love their cows. They are weeping and gnashing their teeth. They are falling to bits. Egypt is being ruined. But Pharaoh won't change his mind. Um, you'll be glad I'm not going to give you a picture for this one. You re- <laughs> Boils. Because now no warning comes, but instead Moses and Aaron, they're given peculiar instructions on this one. Did you see, there's not dust to strike. This time they're to go where? They're to go to a furnace or to a kiln. And they pick up soot and throw it in the air, and this will become, but break out as festering boils, pussy oozing, painful boils all over Egypt and all over the people. All of them. You see Pharaoh in his court on his throne, covered in boils. See his magicians, covered in boils, in agony. They cannot stand before Pharaoh. You see the servants and the slaves of the land, at least those who are not Israelites, covered in boils. Why mention of the furnace or the kiln? It should be a clear echo of the bricks that Israel were forced to make. And here, the fact that Moses and Aaron are sent to the kiln is to say, actually, what is happening here in these plagues is an act of God's holy judgment for the wickedness of Pharaoh and his people as they have enslaved and brutally treated God's children, his people. Another round of plagues, flies, Livestock boils. What does it teach us? Again, it teaches us this big thing. In the Lord's confrontation with Pharaoh, it reveals that the Lord is the only God and King. Pharaoh can do nothing. He's the most powerful man God the world has to offer at this point. He can do nothing. He is no boxer. He he cannot go toe-to-toe. What should we note from this second round? Note particularly this, is that there is a real differentiation now. God is at pains to say, all of this is just falling on Egypt, and it's not falling on my people. So if you were to look to chapter 8 and verse 22, I will deal differently with the land of Goshen, where my people live. No swarms of flies will be there, so that you will know that I, the Lord, am in this land. Then on to chapter 9 and verse 4, the Lord will make a distinction between the livestock of Israel and that of Egypt. And then it's implied that the boils just fall upon the Egyptians and not the Israelites. God is saying, I am God and I love my people. And we should note, we should watch the Israelites relieved of these plagues. Because God is saying, I am this mighty king for your good. And the same might and power that he exercises, is exercised towards us as his people. As he sees us struggling, he says, I am, do you see who I am? I'm the great God who loves you. Like a differentiation between you. I love you. Does that mean we go through life without suffering and pain? No. 
But in God's mighty power, it does mean that we have the one alongside us that we desperately need to help us. Final round. Are you ready for it? Three more plates. And we start, as we enter here, you must note, no, I had Doug read these final rounds of plagues, the, the, the hail and the locusts, because there is a massive ratcheting up of the intensity of what is going on. There's a totality of the destruction that comes. So that when the hail falls, chapter 9, verse 25... Hail struck everything in the fields, both people and animals. It beat down everything growing in the fields and stripped every tree. And then the locusts come and seem to devour everything as well. Chapter 9, verse 15, they covered all the ground until it was black. They devoured all that was left in, after the hail, everything growing in the fields and the fruit on the trees. Totality of judgment and plagues come. Uh, but note that even as the hail is threatened, again Pharaoh is told, let the people go, relief can come, let, it go. let them go. If you don't, hail will come. And God even senses the ferocity of what is coming, and so he warns, he says, bring your animals in. Moses says, bring your animals, your people in, bring them in. And there's a distinction here in Egypt between those people who fear the Lord and say, bring the animals and bring the servants in and do it quick. And then there is Pharaoh and others of his officials whose hearts are hard. And again, we're seeing how stubborn Pharaoh is in his opposition to God, yet how powerless he is to restrain God's plagues. The hail falls. The locusts come. The locusts come. And for an economy that depends upon agriculture, as Egypt did then, the thought that an army of locusts, billions of locusts, would descend upon their nation and eat everything that's left would have been heartbreaking. Because it wouldn't simply dispel economic ruin, it would spell death, because famine would come, and Egypt would truly be broken. But all of this stems from Pharaoh again suddenly saying, no God, your people cannot go. And yet at every point, hail locusts, he depends on Moses and Aaron to set relief upon his land. And it's striking that in chapter, in chapter 10, we read that Pharaoh repents. He seems to turn away. Chapter 10, verse 16, Pharaoh quickly summoned Moses and Aaron, and I've sinned against the Lord your God and against you. Now forgive my sin once more and pray. Pray to the Lord your God to take this deadly pl plague away from me. Even when he's... He's seemingly repenting. He's really doing it with a hard heart. He doesn't want to repent. And he backs down and he says, you aren't going anywhere. The final plague that comes upon Egypt is the plague of darkness. For three days, darkness falls upon the land so thick as treacle, stifles your breath. You, you feel it, you sense it, you cannot see anyone. Everywhere darkness is found. And here we see the final the final plague before the firstborn coming, and we see the first word of God in Genesis 1 verse 3 being undone. Let there be light, and the lights go out in Egypt for three days. What can Egypt do? Well, Egypt has a sun god. They call him Ra. What can he do? Nothing. Nothing. Actually, you can chart your way through almost all the plagues and it seems that Egypt's got a god to deal with that. Not just Pharaoh. They've got a god. I've got a god for that. Livestock, we've got a god for that. The Nile, we've got a god for that. No power. And even in the darkness, the sun is put out. Their sun god is nothing. Because as we're reminded in our big point, each the way through, the Lord's confrontation with Pharaoh reveals that the Lord is the only god and king. Their idols are nothing. The idols are nothing. They cannot save. And remember, this, this, this God is your God. The darkness that falls on Egypt doesn't fall on Goshen. Because people are walking around in light. I would have loved to have seen what darkness around them looked like. But God is he's saying, I'm this, this God for my people. And with numbing familiarity, even in the darkness, Pharaoh says, you ain't going anywhere. And he says to Moses, go away and never come back. And if you come back, I'll kill you. 
And in that moment, Pharaoh rejects the one appointed saviour that God has sent into the land. His hard-heartedness reaches new depths now. So here we have our God. Do you, see, do you see his power? Do you sense his might? It should fill us with wonder that he is this mighty, that a nation wickedly racked up against him and his people can do nothing. The superpower of the day, the spiritual power of the day can do nothing. Well, the question is, how should we respond to this? I want to just briefly look at two things. What are the truths that flow out of this passage that we need to take note of and be encouraged by? The first one is to say this, is that opposition to God is futile. Opposition to God is futile. Our world is replete. It is full with little pharaohs. They turn up in the political sphere. Like a man called Isaiah Afawerki. You might probably haven't heard of him. He's the president of Eritrea. Half the population in Eritrea are Christians and half of them are Muslims. Isaiah Afawerki is a Muslim and he oversees a regime that brutally oppresses Christians. He is opposed to God and his people. I, I could put up a picture of Kim Jong-un, who in North Korea is staunchly opposed to God's people. And this passage says opposition is futile. We see little pharaohs turning up not only in political spheres, but also in education in our land where people are trying to rule out Christians coming into schools and making a clear presentation of who the Lord Jesus is. We see it on university campuses where Christian union groups are told you cannot come. You cannot come here. You cannot meet here. Little pharaohs, seemingly opposed to God and his people. Or you think of the individual who's just clearly opposed to God, maybe at your place of work or lives down the road, and they look so impressive. They seem, it seems that their opposition to God is cashing in. This passage says, if you're opposed to God, that is futile. It is futile. I wonder if you, like me, have ever been punting on a river. I'm punting. I've done it once in Cambridge when my brother was studying at Cambridge. And when you punt, you put the stick in the river and you push it. You know there's one rule you obey when you're punting, don't you? The punt sticks. You don't fight it. If it gets stuck in the riverbed, you let it go. Opposition to the punt is deadly, or at least embarrassing. Because if you hold on to the punt, the boat carries on and you don't. Lighthearted, that makes the point, a somber point actually, to be opposed to the God of heaven is like trying to cling to a punt with a boat carrying on. It's futile. But the thing is, it won't simply end up in embarrassment, will it? Actually, it'll end up very seriously for the opponents of God's people. But look at this whole event from the vantage point of God's people. God's people who've been enslaved in Egypt for 400 years, brutally treated, as they see the resolve of Egypt broken under these nine plagues. They are reminded, as Malcolm was telling us, this Lord is our Lord. And actually opposition to us, well, it will come to an end at a point, won't it? Aren't we to trust God in the face of little pharaohs in our world? He is the only God, the only king, he's the only creator. And you might say, yeah, but Tom, it has been going on for years. People in Eritrea will tell us, it has been going on for years. It doesn't stop the fact that opposition will end. The Israelites could say, this has been going on for centuries, Moses doesn't mean the opposition won't end. doesn't mean that the Lord is not the true God and King he is. Opposition is futile. But secondly, we'd say, we'd say this opposition is deadly. Opposition is deadly. Pharaoh stands as an unbelievably clear warning to you and me as we look at this passage of the deadly consequences of opposing God. Because he ends up rather than having presided over his country to care for it in breaking what he was responsible for, and it will end up in his own death as he will be buried at the bottom of the Red Sea, as we'll see in a couple of weeks' time. And he is a warning not to oppose God and to keep doing it. And the really sobering thing is, is that as he persists in his opposition to God, what happens to his heart? Hard and harder 
and harder. His heart is hardened towards God. He can no longer do what he ought to do because he is set to make his heart hard. Opposition to God is deadly. The difficulty comes, doesn't it, is that you'd have seen it as we read through, the, especially that last round of plagues, is that Pharaoh is not the only one who seems to harden his heart, does he? On your sheet there, you've got print, printed under that heading, hardening Pharaoh's heart, three colours, because there are three ways in which Pharaoh's heart is described as being hardened. It's described simply as being hard. It's described as something that Pharaoh himself makes hard, in the red and then in the blue. It says that the Lord hardened his heart. And as we read our passage, we see all three of these things turn up. Did you look at chapter 9, verse 34? We see these three things all laced together. When Pharaoh saw that the rain and hail and thunder had stopped, he sinned again. He and his officials hardened their hearts. So Pharaoh's heart was hard, and he would not let the Israelites go, just as the Lord had said through Moses. Then the Lord said to Moses, Go to Pharaoh, for I have hardened his heart and the hearts of his officials. Throughout this passage, there seem to be parallel causes running, don't they? Like two rivers flowing into the same ocean. Parallel causes. There's Pharaoh and there is God. How are we to fit these things together? How are we to understand what's going on here? Now, some people want to say that actually... No, the, the, God only hardens Pharaoh's heart in response to Pharaoh's own hardening. And they just list how Pharaoh responds in the plagues. So starting at verse 7, verse 13, the first person to harden Pharaoh's heart is, chapter 8, verse 15, Pharaoh. And they're just saying, God's just hardening Pharaoh's heart because Pharaoh's chosen to do that already. The difficulty comes is that I don't think that does justice to what the Bible says. You see, two references, chapter 4, verse 21, chapter 7, verse 3, seems to suggest that God is intent on hardening Pharaoh's heart from the outset. This is uncomfortable, isn't it? How can this be? I think this is uncomfortable because we think, well, who is responsible for Pharaoh refusing to let God's people go? And we seem to have what is a seeming paradox in Scripture is that Pharaoh... His heart is ruled by the God of heaven, and yet he is utterly responsible for his own actions. Divine sovereignty, yet human responsibility. But how can we fit these? Well, there there are three things that we need to assert are true here. First, that Pharaoh at no point appears to be forced to do what he doesn't want to do. He 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 is doing exactly what he wants to do. Secondly, Pharaoh's guilt before God is genuine because of the way he's acted. And thirdly, although God's hand makes him sovereign, he never is responsible for the wickedness that Pharaoh does. Now, our finite minds get blown up when we try and fit all those things together because in our limitation, we cannot see how they fit. Yet repeatedly in Scripture, God says that they, they are there and they call for humility from us. And the reason why they call for humility is because God is saying, you can't understand everything. You can't understand, you can trust me. And we have more than enough reason to trust God because we have seen him give his best, his son for us. And God says, I am not like you. I'm much greater than you, but you can trust me. How do these things fit together? I think that this is also humbling because we recognize actually that God's power is total. His authority is total. We, we, we want there to be parts of... I certainly want there to be parts of my life in my sinful thinking that's off limits to God. You can't come here. This is my domain. Thank you. And I think humans naturally want our, our decisions, everything, to say God doesn't have any say here. But the Bible says he does, actually. God is the God of heaven and he's the God of hearts. That doesn't diminish our responsibility in the choices we make. doesn't mean our choices aren't real and genuine. Actually, the Bible seems to repeatedly present and say, hey, listen, here's the offer of forgiveness, responds to it, and it gives us real choices to make. But what stands behind it is God's loving, sovereign action. Now, you and I can read about Pharaoh here, and we can be afraid, can't we? We can think, well, if Pharaoh, God said this about Pharaoh, then has he said it about me or about someone I love? The Bible never discloses that to us. 
And actually, the Bible makes clear that the opportunities to respond to God's gracious offer of forgiveness is extended to us. And the Bible, God pleads with us through Scripture, through his people, to respond to the offer of forgiveness. And when we do that with humility, what we find is that we receive God's favour and his kindness. God loves humble people. And yet unseen behind it all is God's sovereign loving care. He is sovereign over heaven. He's sovereign over hearts. And all of this calls for humility before us, from us, before him. We can find it difficult to comprehend that humans are responsible, yet God is sovereign. Yet both things are asserted as true. And they're seen most clearly in the death of the Lord Jesus, aren't they? Remember that Judas, for love of money, what does he do to Jesus? He sells him. He is sinful. He is responsible for what he's done. And yet we're also told in Acts chapter 2, verse 23, that Jesus being handed over was God's deliberate plan and foreknowledge. He planned it, yet Judas was responsible. All of these things call for humility. Humility before the God who has been abundantly shown to be the God who is the only king in our passage, and we are called to trust him. We're called to trust him and to love him and to live for him. And we're to do so humbly and dependently. We're going to see next week that faith in God is essential as we see the Passover lamb slain. And we're going to see the Israelites are far from perfect, but they are saved. What does our passage show? It shows this repeatedly, that in the Lord's confrontation with Pharaoh, the Lord is the only God and King. You and I are to be people who trust him, who love him, who live for him and who recognise the opposition to him is futile and it is deadly. He loves his people, he will guard and protect them. Let's be people who love him, worship him and live for him too. Let's bow our heads, let's pray.